And welcome back to AlexanderRaspberry.com. So excited that you uh, are here today. We have a very exciting subject today uh, that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, we're going to be talking about rediscovering the kingdom of God. Rediscovering the kingdom of God. Uh, the reason why I believe this is so important is because I truly believe that God is leading his church, his bride, his body away from a church mentality to more of a kingdom mentality. Many of you all probably already know this. The Spirit's been kind of wrestling with you on this. It's kind of been already in your spirit. But I really believe that if we are going to have an understanding of what God's kingdom truly entails for us, it's going to be very imperative that we get some type of a foundation of how this is in correlation to what we already know about scripture. Uh, the first thing that we see in understanding uh, or rediscovering the kingdom of God, we got to begin asking questions. The first question comes when we look at the book of Genesis. Uh, chapter 1 verse 1 where it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth now the reason why we have to stop there and ask questions why is because why did God create the heavens and the earth for? I mean, why was it imperative that he created the heavens and the earth? Well, we know about the heavens. We know that scripture teaches us that there are three heavens. The first, the first heaven is the sky that you and I can see every day, the blue sky with the clouds and the birds flying. The second heaven is where the stars are, the moon and sun are hanging out, where the, where the planets are. And the third heaven is what Paul talks about, where he says, I, I know of a man, talking about himself but being humble, I know of a man that went into the uh, third heaven and saw inexpressible things. This is the same heaven that Isaiah Said that after King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated high and mighty on his throne, and the train of his robe filled the entire temple. So we know that there are three heavens, but my question even more is why did God create the earth for? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is that God is a king, that God is a king. In the book of Psalm 47 and verse 7, you'll see the Bible clearly says that God is the king over all of the earth. But it is there in verse 8 that it gives us a hint to one of the intentions of God that God has as a king. The Bible says in verse 8 that he reigns over all of the nations. This is very interesting because we also see in the book of Psalm 115, verses 15 and 16, it says something very interesting to this aspect. It says that blessed is the Lord God, the creator of heaven and the earth. The highest heavens belong to God. The highest heaven, meaning the one that Paul saw, the one that Isaiah saw, that belongs to God. But earth, he has given to man. This is very interesting, guys, because he has given this to us, those who look like him, his sons, his daughters, his offspring. He has given the earth to us. Now, this word given in the Hebrew scripture literally means uh, to be appointed to or to have accountability or as someone who has been given charge over. But this is very interesting because when you look at what a kingdom is, a kingdom, it is a king's domain or the influence of a king's government. So when God gives us the earth, we literally have a responsibility to influence the earth with the culture of heaven. We literally have a responsibility to influence where we are with the culture of God's government, which is in the highest of heavens. This is the awesome thing. Now, we see something that's very interesting in scripture is that in the book of Genesis chapter one, you'll see that when God created Adam and Eve, this is what he put them in the garden to do. He placed them in a garden, but in verse 28, he tells them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In other words, I'm going to put you in a small place, but eventually I want you to begin influencing the earth. I want you to subdue the earth from where you are until you fill the entire earth. This was Adam and Eve's responsibility was to influence the culture of earth from the culture of heaven. And this is where we are today. Now, Paul picks up on this same idea in his evangelistic efforts in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 20 and 21. When he gets to this church here, he tells them, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ as if God is imploring through you all for you all to be reconciled to God through Christ. Jesus. Now, this term here, ambassador, is a very interesting and highlighted term for us because you and I both know what an ambassador is. So some of y'all who don't know what an ambassador is, this is very interesting. Watch this. Write down in foreign countries, over in Europe, over in Russia, over in China, we have what are called U.S. embassies. Now, in these U.S. embassies, we have ambassadors. We have U.S. ambassadors. Now, their chief responsibility is to represent the interest of the American government. Whatever the, Amer whatever the American government's interests are in those foreign nations, that is the chief responsibility of that ambassador. And that's what Paul was picking up on here when he said, we are the ambassadors 
ambassadors for Christ. In other words, I have in me all the culture of heaven. I'm a representative of that place and I came to influence this earth. Now, guys, this is very interesting for us because you and I likewise have that same power. In the book of Psalm 115, verses 15 through 16, a very interesting piece of scripture to this entire puzzle says this, Blessed is God, the creator of heaven and earth. There it goes again. He created heaven and earth. But watch this. The highest heavens belong to God, but earth he has given to man. Now that word given in the Hebrew context literally means to have accountability now or to be given charge over. So God literally gave his sons and daughters, those who look like him, those who would act like him, his offspring. He literally gave us uh, the responsibility to govern earth. Now here's where it gets very interesting at is that when in the book of Genesis, he created Adam and Eve with this very same responsibility. In the garden, he created them to influence the earth with the culture of heaven. Now, you'll see in verse 28 there of Genesis chapter 1 where it says to go and subdue the earth. Now, this word means to subjugate it or to tear down, in other words, to take over. Now, this is used in a negative context in a forceful way. Now, the reason why this is here, he started him there, he started Adam and Eve in the garden and gave them to orders to subdue the earth, was because the rest of the earth was now under the influence of the enemy. It was now under the influence of Lucifer. You will recall that even Jesus in the book of Luke chapter 10 talks about the fall of Lucifer. Now, I want to I want to I want to insert something here uh, that we're going to go back and do a lot more study on and bring it to you because I believe it's going to be good for you to think about this to wrestle with this. In the book of Genesis chapter 1 in verse 1 and in verse 2, if you look very closely, there is what most scholars, a lot of scholars and teachers see as what's called the gap theory. Now, some of you all may have heard of this, some of you all, it may be new for you, but the gap theory suggests that between verses one and verses two of the book of Genesis chapter one, that this is where the fall of Lucifer happened at. Because you'll see here the word bara, in the beginning God created, the word create in the Hebrew is the word bara. And that literally means to, as in to complete or to complete the creation of earth. Now in verse 2 you see that it says that the earth is formed, it was formless and it was void. Now if the word barat means to fully complete, why in verse 2 is it now empty and void? Now, you'll see also this is very interesting because that word bara is different than the word in, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 3, where it says that we know by faith that God, uh, that God created or framed the worlds. Now, that word create in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 3, is the word kartatizo, which literally means to repair or to restore. My God, you're going to get this in just a minute. God literally created the world in chapter 1 of Genesis and verse Verse 1, but because of the uh, fall of Lucifer, when his influence came into the earth, God then had to restore or to repair. So this is why you get some, uh, you get the one, you have the, uh, the Christian uh, scientists on one hand saying that the earth is only 6,000 years old, but then you have other scientists saying that the world is billions and millions of eons of years old. Well, guess what? They're both right. Because when God created the world in the book of Genesis chapter 1, who knows when that happened? But we do know by faith in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3 that it only took six days for uh, so it only took six days for God to complete the restoration of the world from the downfall so in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 everything was complete it was the way that God wanted it to be now you'll see in the book of Second uh, Peter and also in the book of Ezekiel and Isaiah we'll get to those scriptures here and probably in our next uh, video here you'll see that there was an angelic kingdom that was on the earth first. But in verse 2, when the downfall happens, this is why the earth is void and is empty. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, getting ready to recreate, because there, were a lot, there was a lot of mess or chaos that was now on the earth. But you'll see that Adam and Eve 
were put in the garden. This is after God had made the, rep the, the repairs to the actual earth. Now, I bring this up because Adam and Eve were put in the garden during the, during the restoration process. This is why in verse 28, he tells them to subdue the earth because the influence of God's government was not on the earth yet because Lucifer had fallen on the earth and the earth was his reign. And we know that scripture calls him the prince of the air or the prince of the earth. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but, but against high, uh, but against principalities and authorities of high places here in the earthly realm. Okay, So what's very important here is that God told Adam and Eve, I want you to subdue the earth. And that's what you and I have the responsibility to even do now where we are is to subdue the earth by influencing the earth where we are with the culture and the representation of God's government here on the earth. Now, it's a mouthful, but I want to get into uh, how Paul picks up this same idea when he's talking about or dealing with his evangelistic efforts at the church of Corinth. You'll find in, in, in the book of uh, Corinthians, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, he says that we are the ambassadors of Christ. It is as though God is imploring through us that you will be reconciled unto God. Now, this word here, ambassador, is very interesting. It is a very fascinating term because Paul uses it back then, but it has the same meaning then as it, that it does now. If you know in any foreign country, whether it's over in Europe somewhere, whether it's in Russia or in China, right now, America has U.S. embassies. Now, in those U.S. embassies, we have our U.S. ambassadors. Now, their chief responsibility is to carry out the interest of the American government. Whatever our interests are there, however we can influence those nations with our uh, diplomacy, however we can influence those nations with our trade agreements, however we choose to influence those nations, that, that ambassador has that responsibility to carry it out in those foreign lands. Likewise, the Bible is very clear where it says earth is not our home. This is just a temporary place for us. That's why Paul calls himself the ambas an ambassador for Christ because he was imploring people to be reconciled unto God. And he calls himself an ambassador because he was a representative of another world. He was a representative of another government. Now, that's just, this is where you and I come in the picture. If you are an offspring of God, you believe that Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you have been baptized, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, you and I are also ambassadors of God, meaning that wherever you and I go, we have a responsibility to influence that place with the culture of heaven. So it doesn't matter if you're in a bad neighborhood, you have a responsibility to influence it, to change it, to subdue it by unleashing the government or the kingdom of God that is on the inside of you. If you were in a place that is just, uh, if you were in a place where it's just filled with crime, it doesn't matter because you have on the inside of you the, the government of God, when you have the responsibility to influence it with the government of heaven. It does not matter if you find yourself in a bad place. It doesn't matter if you find yourself broken in a bad place. It does not matter where you find yourself, wherever you are. Maybe you're a teenager inside of a school and the school is just going crazy. Everybody's just failing there. Nobody really cares about anybody there. You have a responsibility to literally unleash the kingdom of God to begin influencing that culture there with the culture or the government that is on the inside of you. Now, how do we know that we have this power? Jesus tells us in the book of Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, he was having a conversation with some Pharisees. They said, look, Jesus, you've been talking to us about this kingdom. You've been talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. When is this kingdom coming? And I love Jesus' responses because he never really gives you what you think or expect he's going to give you. And he tells them, listen, guys, the kingdom of God is not going to come with your careful observation. It's not going to, you're not going to look up in the sky and see it. Nobody's going to say, oh, here it is. We'll come and see it. Jesus says very plainly that the kingdom of God is within you. And that's what I'm here to tell you today very briefly, that the kingdom of God is within you and that you and I have the responsibility to subdue, to subjugate those things that are not under the influence of God. You and I have the responsibility to go out there and unleash the power of God, the kingdom of God, so that all, so that all nations, as his word declares in Psalm 47 and verse 8, that all nations become, become submissive to God's reign. Uh, hey, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this. I uh, hope this was worthwhile. I hope you got some questions that are kind of rumbling in your head. Uh, again, sorry, we're trying to compact uh, 
Uh, this is this is weeks upon weeks of study uh, in a matter of seven to eight minutes. So sorry if it sounds a little bit sketchy, uh, but please email me your comments. Email me any questions that you have. I want to answer them for you. I want us to uh, to, to come together. Uh, and, and as always, if you have any prayer requests whatsoever, I want you to make sure that you hit me up uh, alexanderraspberry.com. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again very very soon. Uh, please check us out on the website because we have many things that are getting ready to happen for us here. Love you. Be blessed. Talk to you soon.